Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to see all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, would like to thank Hope Terrigan, as well as our office staff for all their help in putting this program together today. Uh, this day of Yom HaShoah is a deeply painful one. Every one of us and beyond has a connection to the Holocaust in some way. And uh, whether that's a direct connection, a secondary connection, we understand to some very small degree the impact and the significance of the Holocaust and of the commemoration that we have today, um, which is just barely scratched, just barely scratches the surface of what's necessary in terms of our obligation, our responsibility to remember that which happened to our people and to the world. And um, it's really uh, an honor to invite Dr. David Bernstein back to our Zoom screen um, to be able to help us shape this day, understand this day, and give us something to think about um, that can perhaps help us to experience the loss and also to give us direction as we go forward. Uh, David Bernstein is, of course, the Dean of Pardes, as he has been for almost 25 years, an illustrious and significant career in Jewish education, both at Pardes and before Pardes, most significantly um, our historian on our Poland trip in 2018 that we took with KMS, but ever since then has continued to develop his relationship with our shul uh, through these various Zoom sessions on Tisha B'Av, Yom HaShoah, and other occasions where we've been able to have him, Yom HaZikaron, um, giving us uh, a lot to think about, a lot to study, and um, a lot to reflect on. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Bernstein. And uh, some of us on this call today had this chus uh, to actually be with you live in the Warsaw Cemetery for this actual walking tour, uh, but are happy to do a little bit of Chazara today in a virtual walking tour and to hear your insights uh, into what you're going to show us. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Rabbi Weinberg. It's always a pleasure to uh, speak to KMS, uh, whether it's in person or on Zoom. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. So today is indeed Yom HaShoah. Uh, a little, about seven and a half hours ago, we had a siren in Israel for two minutes and everything came to a halt. Um, Someone even told me they were once on Highway 1 between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, uh, and uh, the traffic stopped. So um, at my own perspective, uh, and those of you who came with KMS in 2018, uh, this may sound familiar, my own perspective is that it's important to focus on the life uh, of the Jews, not only their tragic death. Uh, and uh, that's, first of all, to do honor to them. Uh, they weren't only people who died. They were people and communities that lived, that lived very vibrant Jewish lives uh, that I think we can learn from and be inspired by. Uh, and I even think on the level of appreciating the loss, uh, that it's not only that these were human beings, but these were, this was a culture. This was a culture that was, for the most part, destroyed. And, uh, and that's what I'd like to do today. And uh, the irony is that uh, Warsaw was the largest Jewish community in the world in 1939, except for New York. There were 380,000 Jews living in Warsaw. Uh, and um, they were about a third of the population of the city. And the irony is that today, not only are there only a couple of thousand Jews at most that we know of living in Warsaw, but uh, very little remains physically. Uh, when you go to Warsaw to visit Jewish sites, you go to the Nozick Shul, the only shul that survived the war out of about 400 shuls and Batay Midrash, um, there are very few Jewish communal buildings that are still around. There's almost nothing to see. And so tragically, the best place for us to be able to learn about Warsaw Jewry in its life is to go to the cemetery. The cemetery that was founded in 1806 uh, because Jews had been expelled from Warsaw in the 1400s and had lived across the river 
uh, and had not been allowed back into Warsaw until about 1800. And, uh, and actually here, uh, the Beit Kvarot becomes what Chazal call it, the Beit HaChaim. Uh, they use it as a euphemism, but I'd like to use it as our starting off point uh, to learn about the life of Warsaw Jewry. What was life like uh, before the war? And then we'll touch also on the wartime period as well. So I will just put up the PowerPoint. I hope you can see it. Yes. Yes, we can see it. Great. Okay. Also, I'll just uh, let anybody know, um, no one's able to unmute themselves, but if you want, you have a question, you can put it in the chat. And if Dr. Bernstein doesn't see it, I'll alert him to it. And Dr. Bernstein, if you want me to remove that feature and allow people to chime in, please let me know. Okay, no, that's fine. Very good. And hopefully there'll be time to ask questions at the end as well. And we'll stay within our hour that's allotted. Um, okay, so um, one of the things that I think many people have in their mind is this myth that in 1939, uh, Polish Jewry was sort of like Tevya in Fiddler on the Roof. And that does describe some of Polish Jewry, but Polish Jewry was much more diverse uh, than that. And I think that's one of the things that we'll see <clears throat> in the cemetery. So let's begin actually with two great Torah scholars, the Nitziv and Reb Chaim Soloveitchik, and we're looking at the Ohel, the white structure, the white build, small building in front of us, uh, where they are both buried. Uh, these are two uh, Gedolei Hador from the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And uh, here is a picture of the Nitziv. The Nitziv uh, is actually a fascinating period person. He was the Rosh Yeshiva of Volozhin, perhaps the most preeminent of yeshivot in Europe uh, during this time period. He was the Rosh Yeshiva longer than anybody else for about 40 years. Uh, and uh, he was married twice. Uh, his first wife died. His first wife was the granddaughter of Reb Chaim of Volozhin, who founded the Volozhin Yeshiva. His, uh, when she died, he remarried and he married uh, the daughter of uh, Rav Yechiel Michael Epstein, the Arach HaShulchan. Uh, he was an avid Zionist. He was one of the leaders of the Chibat Zion movement uh, and uh, was very, very much against a split in the community. Um, he was somebody who believed uh, that, uh, well, let me say this, uh, as a uh, there's a legend told about him that as a child, he was not very um, adept at his studies. And um, his malamid came to meet with the parents and uh, told the parents, listen, he doesn't have a great future in Torah, in Torah learning, uh, and uh, maybe you should uh, help him learn a trade. Uh, maybe he can become a shoemaker or a tailor. And he saw how disappointed his parents were. And he resolved that he would work hard to be able to live out that dream of being a Torah scholar. So in that sense, the Nitziv has a different story than many of the other Gedolim. Many of the other Gedolim have a story about how they were Iluyim. They were child prodigies. They had mastered uh, Shas by a very young age. They were, they were giving uh, Chidushim, they were writing Chidushim uh, when they were 12. You know, that's what you hear about most Gedolim. And he is an example of something else. He's an example of hard work. He's an example of Hatmada, Hasmada or Hatmada, of Zitzflesh. Uh, and, um, uh, and I think in that sense, it's an inspirational story uh, that maybe all of us can learn a little bit from. Um, he had uh, two sons um, of uh, importance. Uh, one of them uh, was uh, Reb Chaim Berlin. Uh, and you probably know there's a yeshiva named for him. 
Uh, and the other one is uh, Mayer, Mayer Berlin, who has a university named for him, and that is Bar Ilan University. He, for, he Hebraicized his name Berlin to Bar Ilan. Uh, he was a leading religious Zionist figure, and it's after him that Bar Ilan uh, is named. Um, the Netsiva was a beloved Rosh Hashiva, uh, and uh, one of his students was uh, Rav Kook. Uh, another one of his students was Chaim Nachman Bialik. And even though Chaim Nachman Bialik moved away from religious observance, he wrote about his time in the yeshiva with great warmth and love uh, for the Rosh Hashiva, uh, the Netsiv. He also was unusual in that he loved Chumash. He wrote a commentary called the uh, Emek Davar, Emek Davar. Uh, and uh, he used to give actually a Chumash year every day in the yeshiva, which was quite unusual uh, in, in those days. So that's the Netsiv. Buried together with him is Reb Chaim Soloveitchik, also of the yeshiva of Lajan. He was a Ram, uh, a Gemara instructor. Uh, and when the yeshiva closed uh, in the 1890s, um, he, uh, he became the rabbi of Brisk, uh, and uh, also known as the Brisk of Rav. Uh, developed a method of Talmud study known as the Brisk Derech. Uh, which is very prevalent in Yeshiva today. Um, but he was much more than a Talmud Chacham. Uh, Reb Chaim Soloveitchik, who of course is the grandfather of the Rav, uh, Rav Yosef Dov Ber Soloveitchik of Yeshiva University in Boston. Uh, Reb Chaim Soloveitchik was uh, a saintly figure. Um, Anecdotally, it is said, uh, and I don't know if it's true, but it could be true, that uh, three great rabbis around the turn of, the cent of that century were asked, what's the most important function of a rabbi? And uh, they asked the Nitziv, and the Nitziv said to teach Torah to as many people as possible. They asked the Dubna Magid, what's the most important function of a rabbi, and he said, to inspire people with drashot. They asked Reb Chaim Soloveitchik, what's the most important function of a rav? And he said, to protect the orphan, the widow, and the poor. And so he did. Um, when there was a fire and brisk and many people were left homeless and they slept in the shul, he joined them and slept in the shul. He always kept his uh, wood storage open for anybody to take wood to heat their home. And when the Balabatim, the leaders of the community came to him and said, look, we can supply you with wood. We can't supply the entire community with wood for free. Reb Chaim said, how can I live in a warm home when there are people who are cold in their homes? And I wanna share with you something that his grandson, Rav Soloveitchik, wrote about his grandfather, Reb Chaim. It's from Halachic Man. It's on page 95. And Rav Soloveitchik writes the following. The great Tova giants, the Halachic men, par excellence, were champions of truth and justice. They glowed with a resplendent ethical beauty. Space does not permit me here to begin to speak, for example, about his unrelenting efforts to realize the ideals of righteousness and equity. Let me cite one incident. Once two Jews died in Brisk on the same day. In the morning, a poor shoemaker who had lived out his life in obscurity died, while about noontime, a wealthy, prominent member of the community passed away. According to the halacha, in such a case, the one who dies first must be buried first. However, the members of the burial society, who had received a handsome sum from the heirs of the rich man, decided to attend to him first, despite the fact that he had died later. For who was there to plead the cause of the poor man? When Reb Chaim was informed about the incident, he sent a messenger 
of the court to warn the members of the burial society to desist from this disgraceful behavior. The members of the burial society, however, refused to heed the directive of Rebchaim and began to make the arrangements for the burial of the rich man. Rebchaim arose, took his walking stick, trudged over to the house of the deceased and chased away the Hevra Kedisha. Reb Chaim prevailed. The poor man was buried before the rich man. Reb Chaim's enemies multiplied and increased. But the world of the yeshiva, the world of the Netziv and Reb Chaim was not the only world of Polish Jewry around this time. And here we come to a different grave, a grave of Ludwig Zamenhof. Ludwig Zamenhof, here you can see a picture of him, felt that the main reason for hatred among people was difference in language, which he felt caused understanding and of course was connected to the nationalism of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And so Zamenhof was determined, actually even from high school age, to create a universal language in order that people should not misunderstand each other, in order to decrease nationalism, in order to create world peace. His vision was a secular vision an idealistic Jewish vision of a sort, perhaps, uh, but not in a religious context. He actually studied English, but decided that English grammar was too difficult. And he looked for something with an easier uh, grammar uh, to base his language on. It's mostly based on Spanish. Um, he studied medicine, he was an ophthalmologist. And in 1905, he, he uh, organized the first international Esperanto conference. Uh, and uh, there people came together and learned and spoke Esperanto. He translated the Tanakh into Esperanto. He was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. And uh, actually there are many streets named after him. This one is in Tel Aviv. But there are streets named after him in France, in Hungary, in Lithuania, uh, in Poland, in the Czech Republic, Italy, Brazil. Um, actually, if you've read Michael Chabon's uh, Jewish Policeman's Union, uh, it's uh, centered in the Hotel Zamenhof, um, where the detective Lanzmann lives. In any case, uh, Zam, uh, Zamenhof created this language, and uh, you could see that the Tel Aviv street sign uh, is actually uh, uh, written in Hebrew as well as in Esperanto, right? The creator of the international language Esperanto. Uh, about a decade ago, the Wall Street Journal actually ran an article about Esperanto speakers in the world today. Apparently there are still thousands of Esperanto speakers in the world today. And they've organized a special Airbnb system where if you are an Esperanto speaker, um, you can go visit and stay with other Esperanto speakers for free in their homes, as long as you speak Esperanto together. Um, it was joked that when they would have Esperanto conferences, uh, that lunchtime people would relax, go back to their native language, uh, and that most of them would revert to Yiddish because so many of the Esperanto enthusiasts were Jewish. Um, he and his wife, Clara, raised three children, Adam, Sophia, and Lydia, uh, all three of whom perished in the Shoah. We come now to another um, area of the cemetery, and this is the area of the Bund. The Bund was one of three major political movements in Poland in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. There were the Zionists of different stripes. There was Agudat Israel, founded in 1912, uh, which was essentially Haredi Jewry. 
uh, and there was the Bund. The Bund was founded in 1897 in Vilna, and uh, they were dedicated to creating a socialist revolution in Poland. Uh, and uh, they believed that in that new socialist Poland, Jews would be able to have cultural autonomy under the banner of the Yiddish language. And you'll notice that all of the uh, Matsevot and the monuments here are all in red, red being the, cover, the color of the uh, socialists and communists, they're the reds. Uh, some of you are old enough to remember the saying, better dead than red. Um, but the Bund was really an immensely popular in Poland. Um, in Warsaw, it actually uh, received more than a third of the Jewish votes uh, and received more votes than the Zionists or Aguda. Um, and that was because they were the heroes of the working class. They organized strikes. They helped to uh, improve working conditions. They also organized self-defense groups against pogromists. Uh, and so they were very popular. And there was even a saying, on my way to Mincha, I'm going to vote for the Bund, meaning even a religious person, even though the Bund was anti-religious and anti-Zionist, that a religious person might vote for the Bund uh, because of their other platforms in defending the working class uh, and organizing self-defense groups. Uh, one of the people buried in this area, who, as you see, perished in 19... And in 2009 was Marek Edelman. Marek Edelman was one of the leaders of the Warsaw Ghetto Revolt in which the Bundes took part. Um, and what, he was one of the commanders. Uh, and because of that, he had a special place in Polish society. Uh, unlike most Jews, Polish Jews who survived the war and fled Poland uh, during the wave of pogroms that followed World War II, uh, about a thousand Jews were murdered by their Polish neighbors in the aftermath of the war. Marek Edelman stayed, probably because he felt comfortable in a socialist Poland, uh, was not uh, as determined to keep his Jewish identity, um, and, uh, and he stayed. And he became kind of a moral voice in Polish society um, because of his uh, uh, being one of the leaders of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So that uh, in the 1980s, when the Solidarity Movement was protesting against communism and ultimately overthrew the communist regime, Poland was the first country uh, to throw off the yoke of communism uh, as the Iron Curtain fell. Um, in the 1980s, when Marek Edelman came out in favor of the Solidarity Movement and against the communist regime, uh, it was actually uh, an important point in the development of the Solidarity Movement. When Edelman was once asked, uh, why uh, did you uh, join the uprising? Why did the Jews revolt? I mean, clearly they were not going to defeat the Nazis. Uh, he said, well, we knew we would die, but the resistance was choosing how we wanted to live. This brings us to O.L. Peretz. You might be able to make it out here on the very top, Ohel Peretz. And this is actually um, the monument to Peretz and to two other important Yiddish writers, Shlomo Ansky and Yaakov Denizen. Uh, Yaakov Denizen is less well known. He actually uh, not only was a writer, but acted as Peretz's literary agent. Uh, and, uh, but Ansky, uh, you may know because he's the author of the Dibuk. Uh, the Dibuk, which was uh, not only a, an important play and was translated into many languages, uh, but also became a film as part of the burgeoning uh, Yiddish film industry in the early part of the 1900s. Um, it was also the basis of the story uh, of the film, The Exorcist. Um, Yudlamit Peretz is buried here, and Yudlamit Peretz uh, one of the three great Yiddish writers uh, of classic Yiddish literature, Mendel Mocher Sfarim, Shalom Aleichem, and Yud Lamed Peretz. And Peretz, there's another picture of him. Peretz was not only a prolific writer, 
um, but also uh, someone who wrote in Yiddish as well as in Hebrew. Uh, and he believed in the importance of both national languages. Um, Peretz was a lover of the Jewish people. Um, he grew up in a religious home in the city of Zamush. That's where my sister was born, actually, 77 years ago today. This is her birthday uh, at the very end of World War II. Um, and actually, Peretz may even have had uh, Sephardi roots, um, but because uh, Sephardim were the first to settle uh, in, uh, in Zamush, uh, it's unusual for Poland. Um, but uh, later on, the Ashkenazim uh, dominated uh, and the uh, Sephardim lost their Sephardic identity. But his last name is a much more common name in Sephardic circles and Ashkenazi circles. So some think that one of the great Yiddish writers was actually Sephardi. Um, in any case, Peretz loved, even though he moved away from religious observance, his family was uh, religiously observant, uh, like many in his generation of the late 19th and early 20th century, even though he moved away from religious observance, he remained a passionate lover of the Jewish people uh, and was very much dedicated to Jewish cultural autonomy uh, during his lifetime. And um, I'll share with you, uh, let's see if we have time. I just want to check the time. Yeah, I'll, I'll share with you uh, one story that's relevant uh, for our time period. Uh, it's a story called The Magician. Um, and uh, in this story, a magician comes to a shtetl. And the magician actually starts uh, pulling out ribbons from his mouth and scratches his shoes and gold coins come out. Uh, and, and yet he looks very poor. Uh, and he scratches his leg and produces dozens of turkeys uh, and then snaps his fingers and dozens of chalas appear. And yet he looks scrawny and hungry. People ask him, where are you from? He says, London. He says, where are you going to? He says, Paris. <laughs> here he is in Eastern Poland in a small shtetl. They said, what are you doing here? He said, I lost my way. He doesn't show up for shul, not even on Shabbat Agadol. Remember in those days, it was traditional for the Rav to only give a drasha on Shabbat Shuva and Shabbat Agadol. Um, Rabbi Weinberg, don't get any ideas. I think people enjoy your drashot on a weekly basis. Um, but this magician doesn't even show up on Shabbat Agadol and shul. He's a mystery. Meantime, there are two Jews, uh, an elderly couple. They're poor, they've fallen on hard times. And um, they don't have money to even light candles in their home for the Pesach Seder. The husband refuses to go to the community for Ma'ut Chitin, for Kimcha de Pischa, which every community collects to help the poor make Pesach. He's confident that somehow God will help them. And uh, he goes to shul, Leil Pesach, and he's coming home and Peretz describes how on his way home, all the homes are brightly lit. Everybody's preparing for the Seder and the festive meal. He comes home to a dark home. And his wife is despondent. And she's crying in the corner. And he says to her, Gidyantif. And she controls her sobs and says, Gidyantif, Gidyur. And she says, what are we going to do? And the husband says, look, it's Pesach. I'm sure there's a person who will take us in for their Seder. And the wife and the husband are about to leave the home. And as they're leaving the home, all of a sudden, someone appears at the door. It's the magician. And he asks, can I be your guest for Seder night? And they say, we'd love to have you, but we have nothing. And he says, not to worry. Magically, he makes two candlesticks appear. And all of a sudden, 
their little home is lit. <clears throat> he moves the table magically from a corner into the middle of the room, makes a tablecloth appear and has the candlesticks fall onto the table and take their place. There are three hard benches in the room. He moves them magically to the table, tells them get soft, and all of a sudden cushions appear and they become couches for them to recline on. He snaps his finger and a Seder plate appears and matzahs and even Haggadot. The elderly couple don't know what to make of this. They're in shock. And they decide to go to the Rav and to ask him if they can partake of such magically created meals. They go to the Rav and the Rav says, if the matzah will break, if the wine will be poured, if you can touch the pillows on the couches, then it must be real and it's not satanic and you can use them. They come back. The magician, of course, is not there. He's disappeared. They sit down and the matzah did break and the wine did pour and the couches were indeed soft to the touch. And only then did they realize that it was Eliyahu Anavi who had come to make their Seder. When Peretz died, 100,000 Jews came to his funeral in the Warsaw Cemetery. A sign of how much he was beloved by Polish Jewry. Not far from Peretz's grave is the grave of Esther Rachel Kaminska. Esther Rachel Kaminska, who was born in 1870 and died in 1925, was considered the mother of the Yiddish theater. She was an actress. She also eventually, with her husband, and then after her husband died by, on her own, uh, led a Yiddish theater troupe in Warsaw. And Yiddish theater was so popular that in 1937, Half a million tickets were sold to the Yiddish theater in that one year, in that one city of Warsaw alone. Here she is. Her roles were often uh, that of the leading actress in plays by Moliere and Chekhov and uh, Shakespeare translated into Yiddish. <clears throat> but her most famous roles was that of the Yiddish mother, the Jewish mother, the Yiddish mama. And here we can see her with her daughter, Ida Kaminska, uh, who survives the war by fleeing to the Soviet Union, comes back to Poland, reestablishes Yiddish theater in Poland, following in her mother's footsteps. Uh, but in the 1950s, when there's an anti-Semitic purge, emigrates to the United States, where she acted on the Yiddish stage on Second Avenue, in Manhattan. And here is a uh, poster announcing uh, the performance of uh, Mirala Ephros, uh, which is actually a Yiddish version of King Lear uh, about a Jewish mother who gives away her, uh, her wealth a little bit too early um, to two ungrateful children. Um, so this is an example of the Yiddish theater. I mentioned in passing the Yiddish film industry, which was also growing in the 1920s and 30s. Um, at that time, of course, there were millions of Yiddish speakers in the world. Uh, there were six Yiddish dailies that appeared in Warsaw in the interwar years. Every day, six Yiddish papers. Some of us might remember that in New York, there were three Yiddish dailies that appeared even in the 1960s. Um, the Fovards, of course, which was in Yiddish then, not in English. Uh, Der Tog, which is what my father read. Uh, and uh, Der Freiheit, which was a communist Yiddish paper. But uh, Jews in culture were not only involved in Jewish culture. 
Uh, many of you have uh, probably seen the film The Pianist, which won the Oscar for Best Picture the year it came out. And Vladislav Spielmann <clears throat> was a very acculturated Jew who was probably the greatest pianist in Poland and one of the greatest in Europe in the interwar years. Uh, and it reflects the fact that Jews were also very involved in general culture and not only uh, in specifically Jewish culture. <clears throat> the Eish Kodesh. Of Kalman Kalanimus Shapira, known also as the Piasechna Rebbe. Uh, he was the Rebbe in Piasechna, which is on the outskirts of Warsaw. He founded a yeshiva, which had a few hundred students in the interwar years. Someone who was far advanced in his educational thinking for his time. Um, he was very well aware that many young people in the early 20th century were moving away from religious life. And he tried to convince other Jewish educators <clears throat> that they had to show love for every individual student. They had to respect every individual student. Uh, for their own qualities. Uh, and uh, he wrote uh, Chovata Talmidim, Chovata Avrechim. But what he's most famous for today is for his writings in the Warsaw Ghetto, which are called the Esh Kodesh. While his wife and his son are buried in the Warsaw Cemetery, they were killed in the early stages of the war. He continued to live and to give drashot uh, on Shabbat in the Warsaw Ghetto. And he would give his drasha on Shabbat morning and Motzei Shabbat, he would sit and write down what he had said. And he collected all of those documents and I'll explain later how they were preserved. Um, but they've been, they've appeared in a number of editions already as the Esh Kodesh. Uh, there's an English translation that has appeared as well of excerpts from the Yesh Kodesh. Um, he was a person of great faith. Uh, he was a person who uh, talked about how God was crying uh, during the Shoah. Uh, and uh, is a very inspirational person to many people today. He, he was a person who believed in meditation. Uh, and uh, there are many people today who are into meditation, who uh, follow some of the practices of the Piyasechna Rebbe. He was taken to, to uh, Travniki, which was a labor camp outside of Lublin. And ultimately we believe he was killed there uh, in November of 1943 without a burial place. Janusz Korczak. This is a memorial to Janusz Korczak uh, in the Warsaw Cemetery. Uh, he's not buried there, but it's one of a number of memorials to Korczak uh, in Poland. Uh, there are schools named after him. Janusz Korczak, that really wasn't his name. His real name was Henrik Goldschmidt. Uh, he was born into an assimilated Jewish family. He became a physician, a pediatrician. And he said about himself, I am a doctor by education, a pedagogue by chance, a writer by passion, and a psychologist by necessity. He founded a, an orphanage uh, for Jewish children in Warsaw in the interwar years. And he was uh, a great teacher of parenting. Uh, some of you may remember Dr. Benjamin Spock's book, uh, which influenced the parents of us baby boomers. Uh, he was the Dr. Spock of Poland. Uh, he had a radio show. That's when he decided to take the stage name of Janusz Korczak instead of Henrik Goldschmidt. Uh, and uh, it was a much more Polish sounding name. And he, um, he would advise parents uh, with very progressive ideas for its time. Uh, for example, not to physically abuse children, uh, to respect children as human beings, to respect their right even to fail. Um, 
his orphanages had rules that were enforced by the orphans themselves. They had their own tribunal when somebody violated any of the rules. So there was a democratic element in the orphanage as well. His ideas became so popular that Polish Catholics asked him to found an orphanage for Catholic children, which he did in the interwar years. This very important radio personality had many opportunities to flee. Instead, he decided to enter the ghetto together with his Jewish orphans. And he spent the war years in the ghetto raising money to make sure that his orphans would be fed. But during that terrible summer of 1942, when the great deportations began in Warsaw, he and his children were taken to Treblinka. And this memorial attempts to show the picture of him marching with his children to the Umschlag plots, to the gathering place where the Jews were taken before they were put on the trains. Here's a picture of Dr. Janusz Korczak or Henrik Goldschmidt, as was his original name. He was a Zionist, he visited Palestine twice. This is a picture of his, the Jewish orphanage, uh, which was outside the ghetto from the interwar years, had to be relocated when the ghetto was created inside the ghetto. And this is his memorial stone in Treblinka. Uh, for those of you who are with me in Treblinka or have been on to Treblinka on their own, uh, you know there are thousands of stones. A few hundred of them have bear the names of Jewish communities that were deported to Treblinka. The only individual who has a memorial stone in Treblinka is Janusz Korczak, uh, who's viewed both by Jews and Poles as a heroic figure. Dr. And Burns, here is something, Dr. yes. Um, there was a question in the chat, but I think it alerted me to something else maybe you could comment on as we go forward. Um, sure. The question in the chat was specifically about the matzevas in the cemetery and whether there was rabbinic halachic guidelines as to how wide, how tall the matzeva could be. But maybe you could just comment on that, and but also more broadly on the amazing shapes and sizes and differences and the pictures that we've seen on so many of them and how that plays in and whether that's unique to the Warsaw Cemetery or a convention of that time. Yeah, so I don't know the answer about uh, rabbinic limits. It seems to me that some of the matzevot are very large, some of them are very small. I think that's a product of uh, socioeconomic position. Um, some of them are, have, gate, have uh, uh, fences around them. Some of them are ohalim uh, for prominent or wealthy figures. Um, and uh, indeed, as Rabbi Weinberg said, uh, many of them have uh, beautiful uh, inscriptions uh, poems, uh, uh, acrostic poems that tell the story of the person's life and tell about their qualities. And some of them, many of them have graphics uh, for women, Shabbos candles, uh, books when they were learned, um, as for men as well, um, stucco boxes uh, for Kohanim, uh, the fingers spread in the Kohanic fashion, full of vim, a pitcher uh, of water being poured, uh, it, it's really very, very unique. Um, this slide depicts a, uh, a matseva that I know I did not take the KMS group to. Um, Belima Yoselson. Belima Yoselson was a uh, Jewish woman who lived in Warsaw with her family. And um, was forced to live in the Warsaw Ghetto. And they had a hiding place in the ghetto and they survived the great deportations. They survived the uprising. But in August, 1943, at the age of 64, she passed away. Well, the family's in hiding. What are they supposed to do? Um, they can't bury her in the Jewish cemetery. So the family contacted the Polish underground and managed to have her buried 
in the Catholic cemetery that's not far from the Jewish cemetery. In 2012, the grandchildren of Blima Yoselson, because one of her sons survived, the grandchildren came to Poland and with much difficulty were able to have her reinterred. And she was given a Jewish burial here in the Warsaw Jewish Cemetery. She was not able to live freely as a Jew and she was not able to die as a Jew. She had to take the name Stefania Rudlitska. That was the name of her, on her Matseva in the Catholic cemetery, pretending that she was a Polish Catholic who had died. So she couldn't even die as a Jew. And when this, in 2012, when she was reinterred and the family came to Poland and dedicated this Matseva, Rabbi Michael Shudrech, the chief rabbi of Poland, whom the KMSers who came with me were privileged to hear on our trip. Rabbi Michael Shudrech said, this is probably the last burial of somebody from the Warsaw Ghetto. We come to Emanuel Ringelblum. I can't talk about Warsaw Jewry without talking about Emanuel Ringelblum. Emanuel Ringelblum was uh, born in Buchach, Buchach, a small shtetl uh, in eastern Poland. Today it's in the Ukraine. Uh, it's actually where Shai Agnon was born, the Israeli uh, Nobel Prize winner for literature. Uh, he was born into a religious Zionist family. But like many of his generation, he moved away from religious observance, but remained a passionate Jew. His PhD thesis was on the history of the Jews of Warsaw. Uh, and uh, he became a socialist Zionist uh, and believed very deeply, not only in Zionism, but in the value of the simple Jew, of the working class, of the masses of Jews. And so when the war began, he started to keep a diary, but he was not alone in keeping a diary. That doesn't make him unique. What was unique was that he organized 60 men and women into an archival gathering, an archival group called Einig Shabbos. They called themselves Einig Shabbos because they met every Shabbat afternoon in the Jewish Historical Institute, which was in the ghetto at the time, in order to plan their work. For Ringelblum, it was important to preserve everything. It was important to preserve those things because God forbid if the Nazis were victorious, and in 1940 and 41 and 42, it looked like the Nazis would be victorious, no one would tell the story of the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto from a Jewish perspective. His biographer, Sam Cassow, is a professor at Trinity College in Connecticut, titled his biography of Ringelblum, quote, who will write our history, end quote. For Ringelblum, it was critical that the Jewish side of the Warsaw Ghetto, the Jewish history of the Warsaw Ghetto be told and told in its fullest. And so they collected the minutes of the meeting, meetings of the Judenrat, the Jewish council. They collected the writings of the Yesh Kodesh, the drashot that he gave in the Warsaw Ghetto. But Ringelblum was interested. They collected, by, by the way, also the diary of Adam Chernyakov, the head of the Judenrat. But Ringelblum was interested not only in the leadership and the rabbinic leadership and the lay leadership of the ghetto. He wanted to tell the story of the simple Jewish masses too. And so he collected everything from report cards from the underground schools to candy wrappers to posters about the children's plays, to posters about the concerts that were being performed in the ghetto, to ration cards, to the writings of the people who ran the soup kitchens in the ghetto. Ringo Bloom himself was also a social activist. He was involved in helping refugees even before the war. 
And during the war, he helped organize Va'ade Bayit, apartment house committees, where apartment houses would be organized so that when one family needed help, other families would come to their help, to their aid. He chose 60 people, a very diverse group. There were rabbis and there were atheists. There were Zionists and there were anti-Zionist Bundists. There were professors and they were simple people. They were writers and they were people who had never written or published before. Because he knew that the fullest picture would only be gained by having a very wide variety of writers. They organized research studies, for example, of smuggling in the ghetto, of the role of women in the ghetto, and this was decades before any university had a women's studies course. They did a study of religious life in the ghetto. And they also organized poetry writing contests for teenagers to write poems about their life experience in the ghetto. They gave prizes in order to collect firsthand documents from people in the ghetto. Tens of thousands of documents were collected. And those documents were buried in the hope that somebody would find them. Here is an Israeli postage stamp commemorating Ringelblum. The Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw is called the Emanuel Ringelblum Jewish Historical Institute. Here are some of the mill cans and the metal boxes that were used to contain the archive. If you've been to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC, if you've been to Yad Vashem, you've seen these mill cans. This is the largest archive collected during the Shoah. Of the 60 members of Oynik Shabbos, only three of them managed to survive the Shoah. One of them, luckily, was Hirsch Wasser, who knew where one of the uh, locations was. And in 1946, they organized literally an archaeological expedition. Warsaw was all rubble. The ghetto was rubble. You couldn't find not only houses, you couldn't find streets. But nonetheless, they found the first of the three treasure troves of documents. The second was found by Polish construction workers quite by chance around 1950. And the third collection has never been found, although it is rumored to be under the Chinese embassy in Warsaw. Rachel Auerbach was a member of the Onik Shabbos group. And she was in charge of one of the soup kitchens in the Warsaw Ghetto. She was one of the three who survived. And uh, she later made Aliyah. She was the founder of the Survivor Witness Testimony Department at Yad Vashem. And just imagine how crucial that was in the 1950s and 60s when so many survivors were alive to gather their testimonies. Uh, she was instrumental in making sure that survivors took the lead in the Eichmann trial that was held in Jerusalem in 1961. I want to finish, and then we can have time for a few questions, with one of the documents from the Ringelblum archive, Israel Lichtenstein's last testament. With zeal and zest, I threw myself into the work to help assemble archive materials. I was entrusted to be the custodian. I hid the material. Besides me, no one knew. I confided only in my friend Hirschwasser, my superior. Thank God Hirschwasser did survive. It is well hidden. Please God that it be preserved. That will be the finest and best we achieved in the present gruesome time. I know that we will not endure. To survive and remain alive after such horrible murders and massacres is impossible. Therefore, I write this testament of mine. 
Perhaps I am not worthy of being remembered, but just for my grit in working with the Oynik Shabbos Society and for being the most endangered because I hid the entire material. It would be a small thing to give my own head. I risk the head of my dear wife, Gela Sextine, and my treasure, my little daughter, Margalit. I don't want any gratitude, any monument, any praise. I want only a remembrance so that my family, brother and sister abroad, may know what has become of my remains. I want my wife to be remembered. Gela Sextine, artist, dozens of works, talented, didn't manage to exhibit, did not show in public. During the three years of war, worked among children as educator, teacher, made stage sets, costumes for the children's productions, received awards. Now together with me, we are preparing to receive death. I want my little daughter to be remembered. Margalit, 20 months old today, has mastered Yiddish perfectly, speaks a pure Yiddish. At nine months, began to speak Yiddish clearly. In intelligence, she is on a par with three or four-year-old children. I don't want to brag about her. Witnesses to this who tell me about it are the teaching staff of the school at Novolipki 68. I'm not sorry about my life and that of my wife, but I am sorry for the gifted little girl. She deserves to be remembered also. May we be the redeemers for all the rest of the Jews in the whole world. I believe in the survival of our people. Jews will not be annihilated. We, the Jews of Poland, Czechoslovakia, Lithuania, Latvia, are the scapegoat for all Israel in all the other lands. July 31st, 1942, the 11th day of the so-called resettlement action, which is what the Germans called it, in reality, an annihilation action. Israel Lichtenstein's last wish was that he be remembered. And so 80 years later today, in Silver Spring, in Washington, DC, in Yerushalayim for me, we fulfill his last wish. We remember Israel Lichtenstein. We remember his wife, Gela Sextine, the artist. We remember his daughter, Margalit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Brinstein, for that amazing and meaningful presentation, really highlighting the tremendous loss of this day by highlighting what existed in Warsaw and the snapshot of the cemetery. Thank you so much for the enlightening presentation. Uh, if anybody has some questions, though, we have a couple of minutes. Uh, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask. Any questions, comments, parting thoughts? Okay, well, Dr. Brinstein, thank you so much again. Uh, you've left us with a lot to think about and to absorb. Thank you for the presentation, which only have meaningful days ahead. Thank you, we'll see you soon. Thanks so much. Thank you, David. <clears throat>